and welcome to the eighth episode in our Spark Social Justice online series. We really, really hope that you've enjoyed all the episodes so far. We've been really lucky to have such a fantastic range of guests and speakers who have all come on and all inspired us to make a positive difference. And I'm delighted to say that today we are welcoming Liz Firth. Liz is from Bradford and Liz has a long history of campaigning for social justice and helping to support and empower marginalised communities. So she's come on today to tell us a little bit about her experiences and any advice as well that she may have for young people or young adults who might be listening about campaigning for social justice. And um, so Liz, you're very, very welcome. It's great to have you on. Um, I was wondering if we could just start by talking a little bit about um, your own background and you know your own experiences as well and just yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, it's great to be here. So I'm Liz. Um, I live in Bradford. We've just moved recently to a small village kind of on the outskirts of Bradford. Um, and I am one of five. I've got three sisters and a brother. Um, Mum and dad were both teachers. So we grew up, um, yeah, just a really normal childhood in Bradford, went to schools in Bradford. Um, and I suppose my so some of my early memories are like I, I can't remember what year it was but there was a big march and a rally about freeing Nelson Mandela when I was I, I remember being a young child anyway and I remember marching down Leeds Road into Bradford and then being at Bradford's um, football club the grounds and there being this big demonstration about Nelson Mandela so it's not to say that my parents were taking us to things like that regularly but that was something that they absolutely did and I think growing up in a family where Catholic social teaching was important had a big impact on me. So I don't feel like my parents sat around and taught politics often, but we were definitely aware of how you should treat people, that people were equal. They just, and I think particularly my mum, just the behaviour, the way she modelled how we treat other people just had a massive influence on me. And I think if you'd have asked me when I was younger, I wouldn't have realised that because they weren't explicit acts that they did necessarily, but there was just people that, they still do now, they just absolutely lived out their faith and their values. So I think looking back now, I recognise the impact that they had on us. That's absolutely brilliant. And because actually in some of the other episodes as well, Liz, we've talked about the importance of Catholic social teaching, and especially in relation to faith and how that can sometimes be a little bit hidden and how, you know, it's it's an inspiring, isn't it, model for young people to follow that kind of faith in action. And um, so in terms of, you talked about the Nelson Mandela rally and, and all of that. Do you remember any specific um experience that you had of witnessing an injustice of some kind um, that really triggered for you a passion in campaigning for social justice moving forward it could have been an early experience or experience as a young person was there anything that kind of triggered that that passion that you have for for helping others I've been really racking my brains. I don't know what <laughs> anyway. But I suppose for me, the, I don't think there has been a big moment or if there has, mm. I, I'm not remembering it. But I was trying to think, well, when, when did I start finding my own voice in these things? And I can remember being on, I think it was like a scouting trip or something. I was probably about 15 and really ranting at someone when they were saying something really racist. So I remember that that must have been something I was already holding on to as important around how, yeah, how we treat different people, but that racism was something I was absolutely not comfortable with from being quite young. And in Bradford, it's a real issue. It's a, it's absolutely an issue. It's, um, you know, Bradford's a place of migration and the, the people that live there change a lot. And the, I'd say, well, from the outside, it looks like a really diverse city. I think having spent all my working life and my, yeah, always having lived here, I'd say it's a place where, yeah, there's people who absolutely get on with each other, but there's loads of tension and there's loads of discrimination and there's loads of things, um, loads of fear about people different who are different to each other. Um, so that was the thing. I remember also um, being really angry about, about the role of women. And I'd say a lot of that was um, felt in the Catholic Church. I still remain very, very angry and very hurt about the way women, the role of women in the church, um, and just the way we were in, in society generally so i think it's probably still quite true but the um 
the prevalence of sexual harassment towards women so in school just kind of living growing up in a city that was something that yeah was just from from quite a young age being aware of how vulnerable you could be as a, a female so they'd often be we used to live near um, Manningham Park which is a big park in the centre of Bradford um, and yeah it was just common knowledge that there'd be men flashing at women in that park and just so I really was kind of looking and seeing things that were happening and being quite aware of big structural injustices and seeing how that played out in my life but I can't think of anything that really made me go right um, but I'd also say that I didn't necessarily none of those things even though I was aware of them I still lived quite a comfortable life I still am able to live a very comfortable life so I could be safe from those things as well so the privilege that I still have as being white being quite middle class you know not growing up in poverty it just meant yeah I could I could still be safe from it all as well so I could kind of dip my toe in being outraged and and feeling like these things were in, in just but so I went to university I didn't um necessarily no I didn't get involved massively in campaigning or anything at university I needed to work while I was at university I always had jobs and just kind of cracked on with <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say studying really hard but <laughs> but yeah. I enjoyed university life again yeah. was kind of aware of things so I studied French I lived in Paris for a year which was an amazing experience but lots of racism in in France 20 years ago I don't think it's probably changed massively um but I'd say I wasn't someone who joined up with lots of the campaigning um, organisations and, and activities going on at university. That that felt still quite distant from who I was and, and probably the circles that I was moving in. Maybe if I was connected or knew people who were more active, I might have gone down that road. But it, but, so I'd say definitely had a strong sense of my values, but wasn't necessarily living it out in a very public way, I'd say. Mm. And what about would you have any advice Liz um, based on those experiences if for someone who who witnessed an injustice because it's very possible to witness an injustice anywhere at any time and often quite unexpectedly as well um, and what if you were someone who, who saw something that you knew was wrong and you wanted to, to challenge that um, but do you have any advice for what someone might do in that moment? <laughs> so, yeah, because it's something that I am absolutely trying to do more. So I say like 20 years ago, strong values, upset about things, but not necessarily living it out. And then there's been this kind of 20 year journey of me looking at where, where do, do I use my own power, my own capacity to stand up against these things. And so I've done different things. And I'd say um, in the last few years particular, I've recognised how much I, someone once described it to me as, uh, well, two things. Someone just said to me, um, the verse, I can't remember where it came from, I'm not a theologian. Um, to he who much is given, much is expected. So someone absolutely directed that at me, probably 12 years ago um, I was training as a community organizer um, so similar to citizens and the work that Tom Chibo is doing and the um, trainer said to me you know what what are you up to you are you like being liked which is true I, I, I very much operate as a pleaser I love getting on with people I enjoy yeah. having good positive relationships with people and so being liked for me would I would put that ahead of um, challenging things often and yes. so his thing to me was, you know, you've been given a lot and what are you doing with that? And someone else described it to me as you've got privilege. Don't feel bad about it. It's not your fault that you're white <laughs> in a yeah. world where being white is, is often makes life easier for you. But how are you spending that privilege? Where are you using that privilege? Well, so what I've tried to do is think about where, where do I see these things happen? So often I'm someone that in the moment I don't necessarily um, react quickly whether it's in a quiz <laughs> whether it's when I'm put on the spot anything I tend to just freeze I tend to kind of think of the witty comeback kind of the next day um, and that will happen to me in if I see something in public that is an injustice or yeah. when I'm online if I see something I will often not react well so for me it's having to prepare really well for what I what, how I want to act in those situations 
So, um, and I was lucky, I did some training a few years ago, a good while ago now, that was around instances of sexual harassment. So how you'd behave, not so much if it happened to you, but if you saw somebody being sexually harassed in public. And it was really helpful. And I tried to apply what I learned there to other situations. So it was very much around thinking in advance about what you wanted to do, what your role might be. The first thing would absolutely be keep yourself safe, that that has to be the priority above anything else. And we, we know there's awful examples of people that have stood up for things um, and, and it's ended tragically for them. So I think no one would be advocating that somebody put themselves in danger. That's never going to be a good answer. So absolutely prioritise and keeping yourself safe. But then there are still loads of options open to you. So some things that often is important is thinking about the victim. Forget for a while who is the perpetrator or perpetrators of whatever's going on. But what's going on for the victim? Are they alone? So, you know, you might see something happen on a bus. I've seen that happen. Mm. And where a person was, was um, absolutely sat on their own and someone, it started off with a conversation about them. It got louder. The person was looking for a reaction. And so I just went and sat with them and talked to them. And so I didn't feel safe in addressing the perpetrator at that point i think they've been drinking it just didn't feel wise really so see how the victim is can you support that victim um reporting it that's really important so for that particular instance i absolutely once the person had gone off went and got the bus driver and said did you see that happen is this being recorded can we report this um but absolutely the victim gets to choose what happens but just recognising that it can look from the outside like a really small incident, but if you're the person experiencing that, it can be awful for them. It can be a real emotional onslaught. So actually just checking that they're all right. You know, do they need a drink of water? Can you phone someone for them? Is there somewhere that they can be? Do they feel safe? Do they want you, you know, thinking about public transport, which is often where these things happen. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you travel with them? Can you get off the bus with them? Whatever it might be. So I think, Preparing in advance um, is really important. There have been times when I have decided to confront someone. Um, again, a public transport. I don't actually catch buses this that often, so I don't know why it always seems to happen on buses. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was evening time. I was leaving Bradford. I was on a bus. It was a horrible, wet winter's evening, and a woman got on the bus and with a small child. Um, I suspected she was an asylum seeker or a refugee just because of the travel pass she had and it the bus driver wasn't going to let her travel and it was a horrible horrible night and her child was probably younger than my children and I remember thinking mine are in bed you know they're at home they're in bed they're safe and this woman the bus driver tried to kick her off basically and and she was going to walk and so I just walked up. Now, she might not have had the right travel pass, but I just thought, no, this bus driver doesn't need to be doing this now. So I went and said, I'll pay for it. And he's like, no, no, she's scamming. She's scamming. I was like, I don't care. I will do it for that child. That child needs to not be outside walking now. So he let, in the end, he didn't take money off me. He let her on and it was fine. But I think when adrenaline's pumping, you feel mm. scared, you feel very nervous. It's easier to just sit back. But so I think it's about being prepared. It's about staying safe. It's about practicing. It really is. So kind of being ready to go, this is something happening. Can I try this out? So it might be that the public stuff, you're way off that and you're not feeling comfortable there. But actually it's looking for the other opportunities. So um, I think friends and family can be a big thing. So we were selling our house recently and several times people said to us, who's buying it now that might seem quite innocuous but I would often guess and I don't think inaccurately what people meant so they were wanting to know was a white family buying the house or was it an Asian family buying the house and sometimes people would come out and absolutely name and use really offensive terms for asking about who was buying the house and so it can often be quite tricky in those situations do you let it go do you confront the racism and particularly someone like someone was come to repair my washing machine and he was being racist and it's like, oh, this man's in my house for the next two hours. This is going to make things really awkward. It can be easier to turn a blind eye. But actually using those kind of situations, you know, your grandma says something that's really offensive. <laughs> Do you challenge it? Do you not? I think it's really interesting to look at, think about what you want to get out of that situation. So actually it's your grandma's birthday she says something awful are you going to have a go at her on a birthday 
maybe you're not and maybe if your goal is to try and make your grandma think differently about that set of people or that situation then actually having a go at someone can often not be effective because we can often just make someone feel quite ashamed and actually when you're in that point of shame where you've said something and we've all been there we've done mm. something, said something someone's called us out on it you just feel horrible and that's not a place where you're going to change your mind so it's often quite useful to think what makes me change my mind about a situation well it probably isn't by someone shaming you it's probably something else so i think there's a number of things really it's thinking about you might need to make a stand because sometimes it's just about making sure people know that something isn't acceptable so i've absolutely done that where i've called somebody out in public and just got myself out of there quite quickly but said that's not on you can't say that you can't do that because that's also important as well but it might be that in terms of changing people's minds and changing attitude and calling out social injustice it might be that you look for a conversation that's going on on social media between people you know and you think about just try how can you influence how those people feel is there something you can say is there something you can do to just make them think a little bit differently so someone i knew on facebook recently commented all lives matter and i thought oh in the middle of all this black lives matter stuff now she's someone who's a christian i know that her faith is really important to her and so i'd seen that little cartoon that's going around um that's about um some examples that, that jesus gave and it's a little cartoon and i thought actually i could use that with her and so i just said oh i'm not going to give you the name um of course all lives matter actually what's going on at the moment is because of this because of this have you seen this i think it explains it really well and she actually took the post down now she might hate me she might <laughs> she might i might have publicly shamed her i'm hoping i did it in a way that wasn't confrontational that kind of opened up a discussion but i also just felt uncomfortable seeing that and thought no i i think that's not acceptable that she's kind of putting that on social media quite friendly with her i'll have a go and i hoped i did it in a gentle way so i think this stuff i don't think i've got it nailed at all but i'm more prepared to have a go and i think it's becoming easier every time i do it and I'm more prepared to keep practicing, keep trying, and hopefully, yeah, I think if collectively more of us were doing this, then I, I think we might be able to start shifting things a bit. No, have you ever been involved in a campaign about something that is hugely important to you, but you didn't see the change that you wanted to see happen? um and how did you how did you feel about that and how did you cope with that because i imagine that must be quite a sense of loss there that you invest so much into something and it doesn't happen the way you want it to so the, probably the biggest campaign piece of campaigning work that i've been involved in was oh it was a long time ago now um probably about nine years ago so um things were quite different kind of 10 years ago in terms of um what was going on around i'd say around racism and around where people were were having a voice and there was an organization called the english defense league who are still active but they were particularly active then um bradford at that time had a few um bmp councillors so the british national party and the agenda that these types of organizations had they were looking for um getting themselves a political voice a political platform for their beliefs and their beliefs were quite extreme so um, you can go and look it up afterwards, but yeah, very um, anti-Islamic, but very, yeah, an agenda that I absolutely have no time for, no energy for, and was quite scared of, really. Um, and trying to make um, quite racist views kind of publicly acceptable, that was their aim. So they were, they got kind of organised, so by, this would have been 2010, they were in lots of northern and some southern, but really targeting northern towns, um, holding big public demonstrations. And it was a nightmare for local councils and police authorities because they'd hold a big demonstration, which you have the right to do. And I don't argue with their right to, to have to be able to do that. 
but then there'd be counter demonstrations and and they would often be policed equally so which it's really hard if you're trying to campaign against something that you feel is unfair and have a voice in that and you're treated the same as the people that you feel um views are not acceptable um so i wasn't particularly involved in the counter protest um but what a few of us were increasingly feeling so i was quite involved in lots of women's um groups and activities um was where are the women in this so we'd been at a point in bradford sometime before where there had been um a group quite again quite a racist group came to bradford and lots of rumors lots of things got going and and the outcome of some of that not as directly related perhaps it's it's far more complex was that there were riots in bradford lots of people got in prison lots of young muslim um pakistan heritage men were given prison sentences and the damage to the the muslim community in bradford was huge and so lots of the women i were working with were like this is fine that all this is going on but people are um are telling our our young men that they need to go and defend bradford and uh, and so we don't know what's happening. You know, we were caught out five years ago. So in 2005, which was the, the second set of rights in Bradford, um, it was kind of pre-mobile phones. So, so young lads were telling their mums, we're just going to town. We're just, and actually they were going and getting involved in these, these yeah, they ended up being turned as rights. Um, and the consequences were, were horrendous. I'm not saying their actions were horrendous, but the consequences were awful as well. And so the women that I were, was working with um, and talking to, as well as others were saying actually we need to be informed we need to know kind of exactly what is going on and we don't know how to get that information so some of us got together and initially it was about making sure that the women in these communities knew what was going on so we started holding some meetings with um, and luckily at the time there were people um, quite senior in the police and in the council who were women themselves who absolutely got what these um, mums what their concerns were and so we facilitated some public meetings quite public but kind of local and low-key and it was about information it was about building trust between these groups and that that is always how my stuff works it's about relationships and and that's where i feel i can do stuff well so that was it and interesting then some of these women were like do you know what we we need our voices heard in this we don't think it's right that these people can come to our town and these were, when I say women now, we, we were women of all different backgrounds who felt, why should they be able to come and say this about Bradford and, and, and be able to provoke a reaction and us not have our voice in this? And so it kind of ended up that we wanted to, to, to say something about Bradford and make a statement. But actually, we, we were very firmly about keeping ourselves safe. And we were like, and we don't want that narrative of protest, counter protest. We weren't about counter protest. We were just about, here's our town, here's the reality of what it's like to live here, and here are we as women, showing the relationships that we have across those different communities. So the day before the, um, the protesters came, who were coming mainly from outside of Bradford, we kind of did a public, and it wasn't a demonstration, it was really, I don't think we ever found the right word, a public action, I suppose. Um, and we called ourselves Bradford Women for Peace, and because by this point there was lots of plans for the counter protest and and oh gosh it was so dominated by men talking it was men talking and talking and talking and we were like oh do you know what we don't we don't need to fill the space we need to show this we need to show that our lives are connected and so we decided to have no speeches <laughs> so we just kind of got the public space in Bradford we held we had so we were like well what do we do how do you show people what you're about and so we were like well let's do this visually and we've got loads of green ribbon and I'm talking loads of green ribbon so we had green ribbon everywhere and it kind of grew and taxi drivers were tying it onto their aerials of the cars and and it was all around all tied on the public buildings and we got some banners and and banners were up on the hotel that was next to where the the protest was happening and it was it just became a thing that people wore green ribbon to make that statement without words and and we had a song we, <laughs> it, well, i'm not going to sing it it's terrible google it it's shocking it was a bit, a bit more like a dirge really but and on the day what we did was we just talked to people so people were kind of in the middle and doing this throwing this river we were there for hours but the important bit for me was not the action it was those conversations so it was listening to people it was listening to people who said 
I don't agree with what, what, who they are. They don't have a right to come to our town and say this, but actually I am sick of the fact that I'm in a, a flat with my children, but the refugees come and they get a house and a car and a mobile phone and free swimming lessons. And all oh, the stuff that came out of people's mouths about how they felt about who they saw as being the cause of the problem in Bradford. But most people did go, but they ain't got a right to come to our town and tell us that. So it was fascinating. I think it didn't feel satisfying in some ways. Like it's a great story and it looked great. And, and I still look back at it with a lot of fondness. I made some real friendships. I learned a lot from it, but actually it was a really grueling experience as well. And I think, I don't know, it's really hard to kind of explain why it was hard, but just because we were women didn't mean it was any easier to work together it was really hard really hard and there was lots of tension lots of fallings out lots of egos fighting to be the spokesperson to be in charge to name what it was about and who it was about and and it was really interesting that whilst we were really trying to not recreate what was bad about the other spaces we actually didn't have to do it differently ourselves either so that was really eye-opening to me about how intentional and how how much hard work it is to work differently from the way that we know even if the way we know doesn't work and we yeah. don't like it to try and do something differently is still really really hard and it also felt like we really listened for the first time I actually got a real sense of the depth of people's prejudices people's fears the realities of how hard people's lives are and how much we are ready as human beings to blame other people so actually I came away from that experience drained <laughs> and feeling quite hopeless in a way and the protesters still came were very racist and came again several times <laughs> afterwards so oh it's tricky it was it was a real mixture for me and and actually it put me off for a long while right. have been involved in that kind of of protest I suppose is is what I learned from it and afterwards for a long time I mean I was involved in some things I did organize some vigils for the nigerian schoolgirls from chibok who were, were kidnapped and actually not that long after so i kind of go oh i didn't do anything else i did but i was very careful about what my role was and actually i think i put up some boundaries then i recognized that if you're getting involved in this work you need to you need to make sure you're in the right role for you for what you can do for, for where you find your energy, it's got to be joyful. It's got to be something you enjoy doing. Yeah. And it's, you've got to think, where do I get the energy for this? And actually, if you're just finding it draining and hard and you're putting yourself too much at risk, really, and I don't mean from being targeted, but, but giving too much of yourself and you yourself. can get back yes. for yourself, then maybe. And having said that, I look at, the way that Tom Chibo, obviously I'm a fan of Tom, um, yeah. the way that community organising works. And I think, ah, you see, we were not running on community organising principles. So I think also don't jump in and try to do it yourself. Look at what other people have learned. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. So that would be, if I had any advice, looking back, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's, it's not all about the action that you're taking. It's also about planning and preparing for what comes next as well yeah. so but the bit that was important was those relationships that the people i listened to who said the things that i found so hurtful and upsetting for them and to listen to it was actually these are people that don't have relationships with people different to themselves they're getting their information from the media from the worst things that they see in a living in a, a quite a poor city and they're looking yes. to blame so yeah. what i have put my energy into since is trying to look for opportunities where people can meet those people different to themselves so we didn't do it this year because of lockdown but actually this would have been the seventh year that we've run an inter a women's interfaith iftar in bradford so we work with a mosque and i say we work with it's now as it should be over time a group of young women from this mosque in bradford have taken over the running and i just use the networks and and kind of support them to do it but it it's an iftar, so it's the breaking of fast that happens during um, Ramadan. And so 
we go and it's open to any women of any faith background or no faith background and you just we go and we listen and we experience and now it's kind of little discussion groups and workshops where people share different aspects of of, of their faith and their mm-hmm. life as a muslim and and it's gorgeous and it's about mm-hmm. relationships and then we all share food together and yeah. i think that there's people there that i only see once a year but yes. so actually i took from that kind of bruising experience of a, a a piece of social action that i don't think worked well into i am going to put my energy into building relationships so it wasn't a wasted experience but it's definitely not where i sought to put myself again i say so what do you think then we've got a lot of young people young adults that we've been working with who are interested in setting up their own social justice action groups and and taking positive action have you any advice for them about what makes um what makes a good strong powerful campaign first of all that they might want to think about okay so i'd say um Firstly, really think about what you're wanting to get out of it. So mm. what you're wanting to achieve. So know in your mind's eye where you're wanting to get to. And it's fine if you actually know going into it that you want, say you want to achieve this something to be changed. It's fine if you kind of recognise that probably won't happen, but we're still going to make a big noise about it because it might not be now that that change is achieved. It might be further down the line. So I think the example of the, the statue in Bristol, you know, those those people have been involved in petitions in campaigning very politely for a long time now i'm not saying that putting a statue into the river was necessarily the best course of action but actually it's interesting that things can take a long time before they're achieved so know what you're wanting to get out of it but then i'd say before you get very far down that line think about who it affects and if you're not centering in whatever it is you're doing the people whose lives are affected by it then that would worry me i think quite often we can do things on behalf of other people and it's really really important that actually the people that are affected by it who's who who live through whatever it is that you're wanting to tackle are are placed right in the center and that's quite hard because you know it's lovely to get the glory for something it's lovely to be kind of patted on the back but actually it's really not about you if it's not about you you can have a role but your role is supporting the people who it's about it's always about the supporting yeah and as you said just that image on the bus that you described Liz as well if you see someone who is is suffering in some way to just show them that support physically you could sit beside them or just let them know you're there is really important yeah yeah so that would be my key things really would be we need to hear from the people who it it, mm. it directly impacts on not you, you absolutely have a role mm. but your role isn't about putting yourself in the middle of it and then i think don't do anything alone never ever ever do anything alone so find some allies some friends some people who you can plan it with and enjoy the experience as well yeah. you know yeah. it should it should give you energy. It should be something that, yeah, it should feel good to be doing something about something. Um, and I'd say there are so many good people and organisations who will support you. You've got to find them. So don't be thinking that by asking for help, you're going to look rubbish. You're going to look like you don't know what you're doing. Asking for help is massively important and accepting that help. And yeah, they, they'd be the things I'd say and just look after yourself don't burn yourself out don't feel you've got to change the world kind of in a day I think it's oh it sounds so cliche to go look at the example of Jesus but I think it's really interesting thinking about what's going on recently that you know I think of Jesus in the temple got angry kicked stuff about that yeah. there was a place for that there's a place where absolutely but anger is good and and creates energy and it's right to be angry about something but what i find interesting is the compassion that jesus also showed for the perpetrators so when it came to an individual person there was often that holding to account and and being firm but there was so much compassion so i think there's something about holding Mm. institutions to account holding individuals to account but also where is compassion in that? And I'd say just, yeah, vilifying people, it just don't feel good. It, it, it's, it's, they're not going to change. They're going to be grounded into a point of shame where there is no ability to think differently or act differently. 
but yeah. also you're going to feel rubbish about yourself. So I really think about, yeah, just thinking about the values you have that have got you to the point where you want to take action and then making sure you live those values throughout it all. So even if you despise the people that you see as the, the responsible for something, yeah, trying to hold them with some compassion as well at the same time. That's fantastic advice. And so we've talked about campaigning and a little bit about protesting and obviously protesting is very prevalent at the moment. And I just wondered if you thought that protesting was an effective way to instigate change. So you've talked a lot about, you know, change takes time. It doesn't happen straight away. Um, it definitely has a place. And I think, I think in particular the process that are going on at the moment, so Black Lives Matter, the protests that have gone on in Bradford, I haven't been involved. Um, I think for the people that I know who, who are personally impacted on by racism, whether that's systemic racism, whether that's racism that they live on an individual basis, being able to be involved in some of them planning a protest, but being able to go to a protest where they feel supported and recognised and that their experience is real by other people and and that there's a, a time and a place for that is is huge and mm. so yeah it's i've got a colleague that i work with um her children a dual heritage and and for her children to be able to go oh gosh yeah this this is real that we experience and and that other people think it's not right either is massive so absolutely i think protests can do a lot and there's, I think it's the kind of the two sides. There's the being able to state publicly that something is unacceptable. Hmm. That, that it, you know, protests are amazing for doing that. Hmm. On the other hand, hmm. shifting the perspective of people whose views would be kind of what that protest is against. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that it's it effective. does. And I yeah. think, unfortunately, yeah. the way that thinking about the Black Lives Matter, the way that the media has portrayed those protests means actually people I know whose views would be, yeah, not necessarily, not necessarily out and out racist, but actually yes. not really feeling like this is a racist country that actually, yes. well, yeah. no, you know, we're not having police brutality and, and the things that are going on in America, that actually they have what, the, what they've been able to see in the media hasn't convinced them hasn't has made them just feel well actually you shouldn't behave like that you shouldn't be able to put statues in it, it, it becomes about the behavior and... yeah 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 that's right so yeah. i also think i wouldn't want protests yeah. to ever be the, us to think that that is only how change is achieved i would always want that to go alongside something different and actually i think really important is is having an, a positive experience of of meeting or hearing about those people so so a lot of my my energy is is put into now working with or uh, doing that relational bit actually yeah do I know someone who's different to myself can I can I help the people that so through churches I've done that work a lot um yeah just making sure that there is opportunities for those of us that would want to know someone different to ourselves would want to yeah be able to actually speak face to face with someone who who has that different experience than i've got that can shift us and i don't think that's for everyone but i think there's something about a critical mass that actually if enough of us go well actually i can hear that about that group of people but i've met someone myself and i've met them and i understand them and they're not like that so yes. that just being able to hold on to that and there's a whole academic theory behind that it's called contact theory and you can read about it it's proven yeah. and so I, I just kind of hold on to that that protest great can yes. do a lot can be really good for the people who are targeted by whatever it is but also don't just think that's the only way that change is going to happen yeah and um, in terms of the young listeners to this to this episode why is it important to stand up um, and how do you currently support young people that you work with to stand up to injustice and I know that you work with a lot of young people in schools as well at the moment what kind of advice would you have for anyone listening to stand up and why is it important for them to do so I think it's important to think about when it's happened to you and how it felt so we've all had it no matter who we are had an injustice of some sort it might just be 
my 10 year old would say I do it every day where I tell him off because he's fallen out with his four-year-old brother and it was his four-year-old brother's fault but he gets the telling off so yeah. you know, it can be minor but we've all been there we've all been in a situation that was unfair and we've been treated badly hold on to that as something that that that's what we're trying to address isn't it and and some of those situations are going to be huge and and life-changing for people in that they will live through injustice that is 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 unbearable um so i think as young people you have so much ability to influence so the attitudes that you are forming now will be what what shapes society in the future what's shaping society now so your influence is huge and the influence that you have on the people around you is huge so nothing is going to have a greater greater impact on the views of your friends of your peers than you are so it's not feeling like oh well i'm not a politician i'm not this i'm not that i have no power your power is huge it's it's you know it, it and again it's absolutely proven this isn't just my opinion but you as young people are more influenced by other young people than you are by anything and then think about where you change your mind what where when have you thought something in the past and now you think differently think about what made you change what was it that made you feel okay to question yourself to examine your belief or your thought process and to think differently now so it might be you used to believe in father christmas now you don't <laughs> what went on what was the critical thinking that you applied to that belief that you used to hold on to that now you don't anymore yeah. can you apply that critical thinking to other situations and how can you be the person that gets your friends to think critically about what they're hearing so it's interesting there's again lots of research that myth busting doesn't change people's minds so for example you might hold a belief about refugees and i can sit here and go well actually da, 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 about refugees but because you don't believe it because you're fixing your view i can give you all the facts i want that's not going to shift you other things are going to change your view and the most important thing is somehow someone has got to support you in thinking how do i know this to be true what am i basing this on and could i think differently so i think that is the tools you have you have the tools already to be able to support the people around you to think differently about things so that power cannot be underestimated and none of us as adults whether it's teachers whether it's people in government we don't have that ability we don't we've, we've, we've lost it <laughs> so invest yes. in that invest in the power and influence you have and use it in your conversations use it on social media use it how wherever you can find a voice but yeah start practicing it's not going to be easy it will sometimes fail we've said all this and i keep coming back to the fact that child parking spaces in supermarkets we've talked about this already it drives me insane people yeah. park in those now i I just shout at people going to the supermarket. My children get embarrassed because I'm the mum that's like, well, what are you parking there for? I haven't done anything to change that person's view. They'll just look out for the, <laughs> that woman that shouts, you know. So it is a work in yeah. progress. We've got to keep trying this out and hopefully we'll get better at it. But yeah. I think, thank you so much for sharing all this with us today. Um, for anyone uh, listening as well, do check out our other episodes. Liz mentioned Tom Schiebel from Lead Citizens. Tom has recorded an episode for us which, which very much um, focuses on the steps that you can take in your social justice action groups to make change and the practical steps that you can do that. So please do look at that episode. There's lots of fantastic advice in that as well. So that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching and um, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much, Liz. Bye-bye.